Hi, my name is Amanda Easton. I'm a performer, singer-songwriter from yeah. Sydney, Australia. I make retro-inspired theatrical yeah. electronic pop. But when I'm not doing my own music, I do cabaret, uh, cover band gigs, solo gigs, tribute shows, recording sessions. Welcome to my Circle of Life vlog. And I'll be watching you. is definitely a gig with a view. And tonight I'm working with the Classic Kings. Uh, we're doing a 70s rock show. And I'm going to have a talk to John Spence, who runs our band and is the guitarist in the band. I first met him when I was doing a gig with him at Taronga Zoo. And his arm was in a sling, but he's a guitarist. Anyway, since I've got to know him, he's got a really interesting background. Okay, let me give you an interesting background. There you go. <laughs> he's got a really interesting background. He worked with the Wiggles. I'm sure you'll know that multi-trillion dollar kids act and an indie band called the Far Gone Beauties that had a lot of success too. And he runs a really successful prestige guitar business and does lots of things. So I'm looking forward to having a sit down with him and seeing what he has to say. He's also done some great stuff in TV and yeah, anyway, we will find out soon. They're just setting up now. Let's see how they're going. <laughs> Okay, I have John Spence in the hot seat. Okay, John, I met you at Taronga Zoo. Wow. We were doing the Doobie Brothers show and you yeah. had a broken arm? Yeah, yeah, a broken wrist. A broken mm, wrist. Yeah, you were still managing to play the guitar. <laughs> no, I wasn't. You weren't. No, no, not at that stage. Um, that was a show we did with Barry Leaf. It yes. was a nine-piece band, possibly one of the best bands anyone would ever play with. Amazing. Sort of awesome. We've got some of the members here yeah, tonight as well. Yeah, correct. And yep. you were doing backing vocals. I was. And you were about nine and a half months pregnant. I had forgotten about that. Yeah, and you were standing next to me. I, was, I actually was in the show just doing backing vocals with the girls. That's right, yeah, yeah. But when I turned to the right, all I saw was actually your very big, big toe. Belly. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Named Joey now. Correct. We've met Joey. And were you worried that I was about to drop? Because I think the audience were a little bit, Not that girl looks really pregnant. No, you were, very. <laughs> but, and as I recall it, you, were, you came in to fill in for Kim Hart. I did. Um, and I couldn't quite make it. Kim knew the show, you didn't. You just walked in yeah. and did it. It was pretty cool. So, it was yeah. a fun night. It was. But uh, so that's how I met you. And then we uh, ended up doing this show together, yes. which is Classic Kings Rocking the 70s. Yes. And we've been all over the place. The cruise, everything has been great fun. <laughs> prestige guitar business, yep. selling business, mm -hmm. and um, you have other tribute bands. I know that you were in a very popular band in Australia called the Far Gone Beauties. Do and say it quickly. No, don't. Oh, is it something yeah. rude? Yeah, oh. Look at that. Oh, I didn't <laughs> know. Is that where the name came, That's from? Where it came from? Well, let's start there. Tell sure. me about that band. Okay, the Far Gone Beauties, if you say it quickly, you'll get it. <laughs> Um, yes, there was, there was an accidental band. It was a great, fun, accidental band that actually had quite a lot of success accidentally. Um, it had it come about. So I was, um, I've been a good mate of Tommy Emanuel's and Tommy and Phil for 30 plus years. Tommy and Phil were doing a show at the Harbourside Brasserie in Sydney. I do remember Long gone it. great venue yeah. down in the harbour. Um, Tommy rang up one morning on like a Wednesday or something and said, just found out, Phil and I don't go on stage till 11 o'clock. We need a support act. Can you throw <laughs> something together? That happens only in the movies. Correct. And it's tonight and tomorrow night. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, fine. So, you know, I'll see you there. 
So I rang up James Gillard, well-known bass player, singer, vocalist, great guitar player as well, um, multi-talented musician who'd just moved up from Melbourne, having come out of Mondo Rock, oh, and yes. later on Broderick Smith's band. And he'd relocated with his family to Sydney, and he was literally two suburbs away from me, and he made contact and said, I'm looking for work. Anything, I'm up for it. So There you go. Is anything correct. today, now. How about today, James? <laughs> <laughs> and you said, okay, well, let's go. What do we do? I said, we're going to just do a couple of acoustic guitars. We, you know, we, you know, I know we can sing well together, and we'll just do a whole bunch of Neil Young and that kind of stuff. We'll just wing it. We'll just whatever. So we went in and played for that, and we played like an hour or something other before Tommy and Phil, and went over really well. Tommy came up after our set and said, that was actually really good, but let's do a band tomorrow night. No. I'll play drums. And we went... Tommy Emmanuel oh, played drums? Tommy is one of the best drummers in, no, the, in the world. No, that's not fair. No, I know. So Tommy had been playing guitar since he was a little kid, but he was always passionate about drums. He had I also... That. We played together for a while in a band called Gold Rush, and Gold Rush was a kind of like a really great slick country rock band doing everything from Burrito Brothers to... Doobie Brothers to, you know, they were a great band, lots of originals. Phil was a guitar player. Tommy came and played drums with that band for six months and was just, he was unbelievably great drummer. Tommy said at the Harborside Brasserie, let's put a band together. I'll play drums. Um, do you want to bring anybody else in? So I went, yeah, yeah, leave it with me. So I rang up another mate who I'd got to know a bit and his name was Terry Murray. So Terry's a big, tall, pommy bloke from Brixton or somewhere like that. Um, he's, he'd been working with Doug Parkinson, Marsha Hines and all the rest of them. He was between gigs and same story, lives down the road. Yeah. So I thought, I just... Where do you live? This is a magic place. Northern <laughs> Beaches. <laughs> yeah, right. Northern Beaches of Sydney. Where we are now. Exactly. So up the road. Yeah, why wouldn't you want to live here? Correct. Um, so, and it was just, again, because Terry was just, he was just keen to play. Um, we'd done a few th little things together. He was literally around the corner. So we thought, okay, so we, again, we went round to James's house. And threw together a quick rehearsal, got in the car, went to the gig. James is playing bass because that's his natural calling, one of. Um, I'm playing a bit of guitar. Terry's a great guitar player, and everyone sings. Everyone sings. Yeah, so, so that what, that's what makes it. Exactly. So we just did, again we did like an hour of set or something. Then Phil came up and played guitar and went another half an hour, and it was just a great put together great jam band, yeah. and everyone everyone loved it. And an agent came up to us after when we were get, getting a gear off stage and said, is this a band? And we <laughs> said, well, it could be. Now it is. And, he said, and we said, why? And he said, well, I'm an agent from so-and-so, so-and-so. I can get you guys work tomorrow if you want to work. You know, I, I booked these 10 venues or whatever else. And Tommy said, I've got some recording with Dragon in three weeks' time. I'm in Sydney. I'll play drums, but I won't play any guitar, but I'm here for three weeks. And we went, okay. The agent said, what's the band called? And James turned around like that, like he'd been saving it up for a decade and said, the Fargon Beauties. And he went, what? Fargon Beauties, say it quickly. <laughs> I went, okay, looks like there's a band. That's amazing. 10 days later, we actually started, you know, playing that gig circuit in Sydney. We played, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, Sunday afternoons, all over Sydney for about a, a, a year, maybe, and a, a, probably two years, I think. Anyway, after it maybe it wasn't that long, but it maybe maybe sometime into six months or so, um, we had to change drummers off after Tommy had to, to leave. So Doug Bly, the original drummer from Gold Rush, came in and played. Um, and so it was kind of three quarters of a country band. It was kind of right. we didn't quite know where it was heading. We're just doing covers, and we start with Terry Murray. I'm sure it was Terry brought in this idea of saying, "Why don't we do Wild Thing like a country song?" And we went, look, like, how does that work? And he said, okay, like this. And it was like 2-4, fast bluegrass, wild thing. And we, we played it, and it was hilarious. Yeah. No, we <laughs> barely stopped laughing. <laughs> and, and the audiences? Well, we, we just, we sort of snuck it into the set somewhere. So we were just going out doing covers, rock covers and yeah. stuff. And then one week, we had, I think we had that and uh, Hey Joe. We, said we had Wild Thing by the Trogs. We had Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix done in... L loud electric bluegrass style, which we then termed rash grass.
treat. Yeah. Um, it was hilariously good fun. So we found ourselves suddenly being offered some studio time yeah. from a local studio owner. Um, this all happened in the space of a few months. And so we went and recorded a bunch of these thrashgrass songs and some old R&B covers done in bluegrass style. You know, three-part harmony, and, and it was all done with minimal rehearsal, pretty much live. And we made a cassette to sell, just a cheapie. We couldn't afford to do a record back in those days. <laughs> it was way before CD. It was yeah. We're talking like late, late, late 80s. Um, yeah, so we did a... We did a bunch of cassettes to shop around, like demos and stuff. Terry Murray, the guitar player, was working with Doug Mulray occasionally. Yeah, on Triple M. On Triple M. He was the big guy too. And Doug was the big guy in radio yeah. in Sydney. He had, the, he had the biggest audience and all the rest of it. Uh, Terry played him the tape and Doug thought it was fantastic. He yeah. just loved it and he put it straight to air. He put Wild Thing and Hey Joe straight to air on you know, Tuesday morning or something or other and like the phone hadn't been stopped ringing. So. But if you'd planned all of this... No, you couldn't plan it. Uh, you couldn't plan it. And so all of a sudden, now we're doing bigger gigs, we're doing festivals, and you know, it was like, hello, accidental band. How amazing. How, how did it end up? Um, we did that for three years, I think. Um, I, at the time, was doing some, a pretty heavy-duty day job. I was actually managing the Wiggles. Yes, well, I was going to ask you about that. And the Wiggles. You were doing that at the same time. Exactly. So this is now the... So not one career at a time, no, just to crowd no, it all just together. Just to it all yeah, together. Yeah. Um, and to be quite honest, that was a full-on, full-on enterprise. So those, those guys, when they started, we started doing little shows in kindergartens for three hundred bucks, and you know, little things here and there. So you were with them from the beginning. Yeah, well, not quite the very, very beginning, but with that lineup. Yeah. Doing, um, there used to be a fifth wiggle, and they would, they had done some other shows, but when they got serious and went full time, uh, they'd recorded an album, two albums for ABC, and. They said we needed management. I'd been working with them doing a whole lot of other shows for ABC where they were just using uh, the ABC platform as a showcase for their recorded kids artists. Um, so I got to know them. We kicked it off really well. Um, I just decided to say, OK, I think I can do this. I really yeah. believe in what they were doing. So the Wiggles thing, I was like a year into the Wiggles thing while the Fargons were going great. And to be quite honest, I actually didn't have time and I had to leave. So I actually walked away from the band all happily. Yeah. Um, they replaced me with um, a couple of guys over a period of years. Um, we actually did get back together in 2006 for the Gimpy Muster. So oh we played, yeah, that's nice. the Fargons played the Gimpy Muster about five times. It was terrific, it was, yeah. you know, big audiences and yeah. it all was just fun. And um, it, it was, you know, we got paid to have fun, it was terrific. Um, and so in 2006, we actually put the band back together, um, did some rehearsals, and went out and played to 20,000 people. How nice. <laughs> so is that likely to happen again, do That you was think? the last gig we ever done. Yeah. yeah that was, it was, we kind of did it and lived through it, and went, that's yeah. probably everything. Well, it's hard to kind of beat that, probably, yeah, that so it's amazing. a good way to, to give finish, it a tick. Give it a tick. Yeah. Great fun. So in the meantime, the Wiggles are taking off, well, yeah. eventually. No, they did. They yeah. were um, they were just going from strength to strength. Um, wherever he played, them were, they just had accolades everywhere. The the, the one uh, key moment was that um, I had previously worked at Channel Nine um, in music production on t uh, Tonight shows, etc. And so I had some contacts there. Um, and when the Wiggles were really, really making some big noise out there in the live arena, um, we knew we had to kick it into the next level. So I actually called a producer friend um, who was then working with Ray Martin on uh, what was the show then back in the day um, and it was a 7.30 show on Channel, uh, channel Oh Nine. yeah. Yep. Current Affair there we go. Uh -huh. Yep and um, and they said yeah well let's do a story so they did a story on the Wiggles and they brought a camera crew out and, and shot a day with the Wiggles at the Hills Centre you know yeah. like a big theatre there um, with three audiences coming in on and they, they walked away, they produced a great, probably about a five minute, maybe seven minute uh, little segment on the Wiggles. And again, same story, the phone just started ringing, never stopped, it just went on. So. Is that your first experience in management? Um, in 
Or you're apart managing from your own the bands, bands. Yeah, yeah, apart from my own yeah. bands, things, but yeah. yes, certainly managing a third party. But um, yeah. it was a really good experience, and you know, it worked really well for about five years or so. And then we sort of actually went out of separate ways. That's yeah. another whole story. They did a big deal in America. Yeah. They needed another representation, and so it went on. Um, you know, no regrets. Everybody had, had a good time. So how different was it um, managing and being in your own thrash? Thrash grass. grass. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it rock. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, it's the rock kind of side of yeah, the industry yeah. compared to being in a kids at. I yeah. mean, uh, it's got to be different. Well, totally different. We actually, with the Wiggles, kind of um, sort of rewrote the rules on, on how to present children's ent entertainment in this country. So up till that time, the um, pretty much Don Spencer from Play School yep. and the Play School show itself pretty much had that live kids concert market sewn up. They mm. were going around the country doing great shows, a great business, and they were doing really well. And terrific shows and all the rest of it. Um, what we did was try to plug into uh, a bit of that same audience, but what we decided to do is rather than find a local promoter out in Orange or Mudgee or whatever else, we actually contacted daycare centres, the nursing mothers associations, PNCs, school organisations, we found parents groups, mainly mums, who needed to do fundraisers and we taught them how to be promoters. So we sent them a Wiggles promotion pack. So we taught them how to do it and said, Here, this is what you do. You for go and find a venue. Um, here's a bunch of posters. Here are all the printed numbered tickets. Here's the ticket price. Here's how you be a promoter. And by the way, you have to get some radio time. You need to get some stuff in the newspapers. And we taught them how to do this. And we did it for three years. That's amazing. How fantastic. And, and everybody yeah. benefited. They benefited. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we, did, we gave a venue. fair chunk of the proceedings to, to the, the, charity. Uh, the charity, mm -hmm. the organisers. Um, and it just kept going bigger and bigger until, uh, you know, eventually we're, we're doing theatres and it's all getting had pretty crazy. And it had yeah. to go overseas. Yeah. So how do um, a bunch of guys, because there was no girl in the Wiggles back no, in those yeah. days, how did a bunch of guys, after doing a kids' show, relax? Because I'm sure they relax differently. <laughs> or do they to the far gone beauties that were out <laughs> on the road? I mean, you might have been talking afternoons rather than two o'clock in the morning. It's pretty much correct. <laughs> no, was, the whole thing is the Wiggles guys are sort of such you know, easygoing, straight guys. Yeah. They were always, I mean, there's, there were three teachers there and Jeff Patton, you know, lifelong musician. Yeah. Um, and so that they had the kids' best interests at heart. There's nobody, there's, there's no damage done backstage with the Wiggles, I yeah, can tell you, never yeah, was. Anyway. Yeah, oh, nice to yeah, hear. Easy. <laughs> so um, you, you said earlier, and it was probably partly a joke, that you've had 17 careers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, they're the ones that I know about. Uh, any other, uh, out of the <laughs> 17, what are other highlights? Um, highlights was working at Channel 9. So I, um, you know, coming out of playing in bands and everything, I, I knew, I, you know, I'd got pretty much hit my late 20s. I'd moved back to Sydney. We were living on the North Coast, playing in bands, having fun. Um, needed to get a bit serious and thought, need a day job. Yeah. What could, you know... Because marriage and kids were on the horizon? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Married, quite married for a while. Um, into mortgages, got two children, yeah, got yeah. to pay the bills. <laughs> yes. Pretty hard to do. We're talking back in the mid early 80s here, mm. and even back then it was hard to make a living as a musician, even if you were working. It was pretty, you know, line ball back then. Mm. So I kind of made a decision that um, not to try and make it, to rely on playing live to make a living. I was always wanted to keep playing live and luckily have done so, but it was never going to, I never had to, re I didn't want to rely on it to pay the mortgage, etc. So a friend of mine um, had, uh, sorry, his, a friend of mine's wife was actually working as a segment producer on the Today Show at Channel 9. Um, and he was actually a, a musician friend, and so we played bands together. And, and Penny would just talk about her day job, and it was just sounded like too much fun. Yeah. So you've got to be kidding me, working you know television, doing live crosses, and doing all that sort of stuff. And I said, wouldn't it? Uh, to myself, I thought if I could find a way to combine uh, some experience in music and working in television, well, that'd be the ideal job. So I, I actually spent a year hunting that down. So doing odd jobs and other things, uh, and still playing in bands. I actually did almost a year pro bono free work for some television productions, including some Channel 9 stuff, where I was just, I was quite clearly saying, I, I need experience, I yeah. need to know how to do this stuff. Right. And I'm looking for a job at the end of the Fantastic. day, somewhere down the track. And you weren't 15, because a lot of um, people coming straight out of school do that kind of thing. Oh, They're yeah, encouraged no. to do it. Sometimes 20s. resent doing it. 
Yeah. But yet you were in your late twenties, but you had a vision to do something specific, yeah. and you knew you had to build up some kind of experience and, exactly. and networks, no and doubt as well. And that's Contacts. precise. It yeah. really is who you know. So in yeah. the end of the day, after doing all that pro bono work, I did have a group of people who knew me, and yeah. I'd actually d done work with these people. Um, and eventually, the word filtered through that the Mike Walsh show, which was a very, very big daytime variety show, um, had moved from Channel Ten to Channel Nine, had gone even well, even better. Sorry, Channel Nine. Uh, but then uh, it was going to nighttime the following year. And uh, nighttime variety shows is big budget land television. Mm. So this, we're talking 1985, um, very expensive live to air TV, big budget. Mr. Packer was all in. Yeah. Mike Walsh was the, 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 the blue, yeah, what was I saying? He, he was the man. He had the audience and was going to bring them into nighttime. Um, so I found out that they needed a talent coordinator. It was the person that actually books all the, the live music sh acts on the show. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's my dream job. Yeah. So I ended up going to the cottage. I couldn't get anyone to take a phone call. I went to the production cottage, which is a little house next door to Channel 9's building. And I just walked in and sat down on the lounge and explained to the receptionist that I was looking to speak to a senior producer about the talent coordinator's job, and I have all day. And I'm quite happy to wait. And so I waited and I waited and I waited and all the producers came out and said, who are you, what do you want? And I said, same story. I'm the talent coordinator, <laughs> can't you anyway, tell? <laughs> finally, about two o'clock, um, uh, a senior executive, a senior producer came out and the guy was actually my age, but he was, he was a gun, young gun, bright producer who'd been working with Walsh and Nine for some years. And um, anyway, so he, he li literally, we walked out to the garden and he didn't talk about television at all. We just talked about stuff about life and, mm you know, living and playing in bands and, uh, you know, just fun stuff. Anyway, next thing you know, I just, uh, I got a phone call saying, come in, Mike Walsh wants to meet you. Came into a pretty heavy duty meeting with um, all the senior producer producing staff. Um, and I just said, who have I got to kill to get this job? And, I got <laughs> so, and that was great fun, but um, that was the year that um, Mike Walsh actually imploded, unfortunately. Um, on with the big budget TV show, it didn't work. Oh. So the, the expectation was so high, right. uh, for various reasons it was never met, and that show didn't quite last the year. So we're talking about, you're talking big budget stuff here. We were doing, you know, massive things. There was like dancers in a 30 piece band. It was just like oh, insane. You need that oh. again. Back in the day, it, it was actually a great show. Yeah. But they, um, they couldn't sustain the production values to mm. actually to, to remain competitive, the audiences were dwindling and all the rest of it. And Mr. Packer had a very serious interest in cricket around that time, if you mm. remember. And the Ashes test was on and he said to Mr. Walsh, time to go. Need your time slot. Yeah, mate. need your time slot. We're <laughs> going to put on the Ashes from England. <laughs> so we all walked Australia in. We sport. all walked in. This is the first thing you learn about television. Nothing is secure. Yeah. Um, and so after nine months, um, we got a call. We had a production meeting at two o'clock on a Monday afternoon. We were very weird. Something is not right. And all of a sudden, they said uh, tonight's the last show. But I came back later and worked, did a couple of years with Ray Martin on mm -hmm. the midday show. Yep. Same job. Fantastic. Which is how you met people like Rex, though. Correct. Right? Yep. Yeah. Rex was in the band. Yeah. Uh, along with a number, well, Jeff Harvey, band leader, had the best players in Sydney. Yeah. And on a rotating basis, he had three different bands that rotated around week by week. So there were 30 musicians, um, all of whom were the best guys in Sydney, and it was absolutely delight. We used to sit there, with, I used to sit with the technical crew in rehearsals every day, thinking, we'd say out loud, this is the best place to be in the world. Mm. You know, we're on the floor, we're doing live television. There's Joni Mitchell. Oh my goodness. You know, <laughs> working with our band. Yeah, Are you how fantastic. Me? There's yeah. stuff like that going on. Tony Bennett. Yeah. You know, just going. Wow. So everybody who was touring in Australia in those years did the midday did that show. show. And it was always live. Always 100% live. So there, there had to be fuck ups. Can you, you tell me what? about one of say, those? This, two this of those? is a crazy, absolute mad thing. Then in three and a half years of television work that I did live to air stuff at nine, there was never one, not even a technical. That's amazing. Not not one mistake. Yeah, even from the artists themselves, because no. I'm thinking that's more likely where it's going to no, come from. No, we've seen some absolute decide. bloopers, and, yeah. we, and we've seen some meltdowns and some mistakes where people think they weren't live. Yes. <laughs> and but this this was such a well oiled machine. There yeah. was, it was the best floor crew in the country, possibly in the world, and I don't say it lightly because the American acts would come in 
and first of all, my job as a talent coordinator is that I would be calling the, um, the promoter, or sometimes they'd be calling me, and at some point in the conversation say, yeah, we'd love to have Tom Jones on, but it's it's 100% live. Yeah. And he said, no, no, Tom doesn't sing live until he's involved. Sorry, what? that's our policy. Surely not. I don't know, I'm just making it up. Okay, it's just but some thing. people say some that. Some people say yeah. that. Most of the Americans would say that. Really? Oh, yeah. And they're certainly not going to play with a live band that they've never met. That they would maybe maybe concede to doing a live vocal to a backing track, but we're saying no. Sorry, right. our policy mm. is 100% live. So yeah. we've got a live band. We do this every day. No rehearsal. Well, you yeah, have yeah. you have one rehearsal. Short rehearsal. So yeah. in the morning, the schedule is very simple. The show goes live to where at midday. Um, <coughs> rehearsal start at 10 from memory. Um, we had three three live to air performers each each day. <coughs> so usually they if they're self-contained, that's a band set up in their own right, but usually there were three singers working with the Jeff Harvey band, so they get half an hour each. Right. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Half an hour. Yeah. Half Obviously an hour. the band, band had already got their stuff completely down. It's just a matter they, of working together. The band together would never really. rehearse the songs until that day, because they were doing they were doing the same thing yesterday and the day before that. Right. So at nine o'clock in the morning, the band would come in, um, and nine thirty, maybe thirty, nine thirty, I think. Um, and Jeff would just run them through. Okay, so today we have Peter Couples doing "Isn't She Lovely" in the key of C. Yeah. And then they'd they'd run that, and then okay, next. And they would just literally <laughs> run the charts without the singer. Wow. The singer would come in. The first singer would come in at ten o'clock, and they yeah. go three, four, go. They would do three runs maximum. If they didn't cut it, bad luck, baby. You better get it together before you go live to air, mm. because ten thirty. Sorry, next. Boom. Yeah. Them in. Now the. the, the the Americans and the tour managers and the promoters were just apoplectic at this because they never, <laughs> did, even Johnny Doesn't Carson happen. and all that stuff, they don't, yeah. it just never happened. Back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, yeah, Dean Martin and Sammy Davis and all that stuff, they, they would do it live, and they, but not in the 80s. It wasn't really happening. Right. There, was no, there was nowhere in the world that was doing 15 live to air music spots a week. Oh, amazing. <laughs> so it was, and yeah. that's what we were saying. We'd be sitting in the studio going, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm part of it. Yeah. yeah. Get to do it tomorrow. Th which are the interesting artists, that the really interesting ones that stood out for positive or negative reasons, um, you know, artists mm -hmm. that we would know? Um, Tommy Emmanuel, is, as I said, has been a long-time friend, and I've known Tommy since way before he was successful as a musician. He's now performing all around the world. And I, I have great uh, memories of, um, of getting him onto television, you know, live television for the first time. And, and so I put him on the midday show and I, there was resistance because people didn't know who he was and maybe they thought he was just my friend but he's extraordinary <laughs> talent. Gosh, and everyone knows that now, surely. And this was the yeah. thing was, but anyway, so Tommy was, you know, turning up every time he was in Sydney and we'd have him on the midday show um, and he, you know, he'd play and Ray Martin would interview him and all the rest of it. Uh, he could never get on any other show until eventually, I, I, his management tried for like a year to get him onto Hey Hey Saturday. Right. And they just kept saying, no, he doesn't sing. We don't want a, just a guitar player. We've got guitar players. That's not going to work. Yeah. Even though he'd been going down great guns and all the rest of it from, with the daytime audience. Um, and finally, somehow, someone twisted Daryl's arm, Daryl Summers here, the host of Hey Hey. And to Tommy was one of the biggest stars they ever had on that show. He was a regular. Mm. And I like to think I helped a little bit. Sounds like you helped a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah. what does music mean to you? Oh, God, it's the reason I... <laughs> it, music was a, a big part of my life when I was a kid. My mum was a, an opera singer and, you know, made me go to the choir at church and do all that sort of stuff. But I discovered this group called The Beatles when I was the like... The Beatles, yeah, I think I've heard yeah, of them. Yeah. When I was about, probably about nine, my grandparents gave me a transistor radio when I was nine years old. They'd been to Japan. It was the only place you could buy one oh. back in the early 60s. Yeah. And I lived with that little earphone thing in my, you know, every night. And um, all of a sudden, the world of music was, you know, was a really young kid. And then I heard this group called the Beatles. And I went, what's that? And I just kind of went, Whoa, hang on. Um, and yeah, and then it became the Rolling Stones and the Animals and you know, the Who and God knows and everything else. So I was just totally transfixed by it. So... You know, you do school and you do your fun and your sport and your everything else and all the rest of it. But I've been playing in bands since I was 12 years old. Right. So, so there was never any other career path that you were thinking of? No, yeah. I'd actually, um, I'd, the same story going back to the early days. 
um, straight out of high school I actually started to become a teacher and I did actually teach primary school and high school music. Uh -huh. It was still music. It was still music. Yeah. And that I got lucky with the, I, I did with the music thing because I actually was trained as a primary school teacher which I knew I was never really going to be very good at and probably hang around too long at. But um, early in my, even my first year of teaching the principal came in and said, oh, I hear you play the guitar, son. And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, oh, well, the high school, you know, this is a country school we're talking about here where the high school and, and the junior school are all together. High school hasn't had a music teacher for, what, six years. Do you want to be it? So half of my face-to-face -face teaching time was actually teaching high school music without any qualifications whatsoever. And I said, I can't read music, and I certainly don't know enough theory to teach that when this doesn't matter. Just teach them to enjoy it. Oh, what a lovely That's attitude. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so to most of my teaching time, I was actually, you know, very luckily allowed to be teaching music. So, um, the stuff that I've uh, heard from you tonight, then, there seems to be a lot of lucky things that have happened, but at the same time, the TV thing, you worked really hard. Yeah. Do you think it's because you were working really hard behind the scenes and prepared that the luck kind of happened? Yeah, I think you make your own luck. Mm. Um, in many cases, that's been the way. I've always been lucky, is the word. Where if if I if I knew what I wanted, I can sort of just really narrow that focus down and kind yeah. of go for it. Um, and that's you know I think it's really challenging. So I've got adult children, and you know as they were growing up, I kept saying the hardest thing to do is actually nail down what it is you want to do. Definitely, and we're lucky because I feel the same way that yeah. I always knew what I wanted to yeah. do, and but a lot of people don't. Correct. If you've got a real passion for something and you can find a way to make that work to make a living, yeah, it's you know it's that focus is kind of easy. And people say, I'm sure they do to you, they do to me, you're so lucky to do something that you love. And yes, I do feel lucky, mm. but at the same time, it's not as if it just kind of fell in my life. No, it's not all luck. <laughs> no. no well, making any sort of living out of music has never yeah. been harder. Yeah. yeah. So you think that? It's harder, well, never been harder, harder than now. now. Yeah. Even sure. though you were saying it was still hard in the 80s. Because we yeah. think of the 80s as, as the golden period where there were live bands mm. on every street corner. And, and there were, comparatively, comparatively but yeah. it still was hard to make money. Yeah, I'm just. I was looking back at the musicians that were working full time then, and there was an awful lot more of them. Right. The high level players working, you know, many nights a week and all the rest of it. Yeah. But you have to, you know, put it in in context. Is that a lot of those guys, for example, if they were in the Jeff Harvey Harvey band and reading music and working with overseas artists at the highest level, you know, on Friday night they're playing some little jazz gig for about sixty bucks yeah. somewhere because that's the music they love. Yeah. So uh, my view is that the you know, the top 10% of the big artists in the world make about 90% of the money. Yes, of course, yeah. And the rest of the hard-working musicians that really have to work hard, you know, have to work really hard to make a living. Yeah, yeah. but we wouldn't have it any other way. No. Well, we might want to be the 10%, but we apart would, from that, we still we want would. to be in this. That's yeah. right, but that, you see, I sort of took a left turn somewhere because I kind of made it easier on myself with the decision to not have to rely on, on being a player but I, at the same token, I knew I had to work really hard to find a way to still work in music that was actually going to pay me a living wage. Mm -hmm. And um, when, I, when I saw the television window open, that was the window that helped me enormously. It's very hard to maintain a long career in media. Mm -hmm. And particularly, you know, you're not, if, you, if you seem to be too old, you're not seem to be cutting edge. You're not, you're kinda, you're not the hip guy anymore. So yeah. what was happening was that I would be quietly saying thanks very much you know long service leave see you later and we bring in the new hip crew and this happened for a few years <laughs> um, and you know the new production team would come in and maybe things didn't quite work out the way they planned or whatever else and the phone calls that I was then getting two years later was please like please come back yeah can you this did happen a lot I can, bet it can you come back and do you know fix it and yeah. I kind of go well that's a bit like being a dentist it's just fixing things. Yeah, right. No one really that's likes not what going I to the dentist. To <laughs> so I started my little new venture called Premier Guitars because I wanted to stay connected to the music uh, community. Um, and the production work was becoming a, mm, a little bit pulling teeth, like I was saying. Yeah. And um, there was a little gap in the market for a, a boutique business that connects sellers with buyers of high end, you know, high uh, great guitars and yeah. amps and stuff like that. So now I'm lo ha having a, supposedly be my semi-retirement part-time job, which is now taken over my life. Of course it has. <laughs> Along with still playing in bands. Yeah, so. which is wonderful. Well, we have a sound check to get to, so yeah. thank you so much for talking to me. Amanda? Truth